You can't blame one specific person. I just put it down to an act of war. You paid your money and you take your chances. Good evening. In many ways, 1982 was the year of the unexpected. Who would have dreamt a year ago that Britain would fight a war in the South Atlantic, that Israeli troops would be in Beirut, that a Pope's pilgrimage to Britain would be so triumphant? All these and much more are in our program tonight. But first, a flavor of the sights and sounds that made 1982. Employment itself is now rising more slowly. The pilot came on. He said, I've got some bad news for you. The lake no longer exists. We had no intention of making any concessions. Well, we did do it after all. Yeah! Abhorrent and a scandal. The jury finds that the defendant, Klaus Van Buren, guilty. Our objective is to recover the Falkland Islands. So what matters is that the fleet is on its way. General Belgrano was hit by torpedoes. HMS Sheffield was attacked. I ask you to join me praying for a peaceful solution to the conflict. It was a day of extraordinary heroism and selflessness. They are flying white flags over Port Stanley. Callous crimes have been committed by evil men. That's the one thing I know that I, I felt. The way forward is not by trying to bring industrial muscle. There are risks on behalf of all the people, and I think it's a worthwhile risk. The important thing is to, to be British and not panic. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be able to say to you, welcome to Channel 4. All the available he evidence hasn't been presented at this inquest. It's important our two countries should have a, a good and close relationship. Those who can plant a bomb without warning in a crowded disco are the enemies of all the people in these islands. For Britain at least, 1982 was dominated by the battle for the Falklands. It won the government unprecedented public support at home. Abroad, many were incredulous it was happening at all. The invasion cost the Foreign Secretary, Lord Carrington, his job. The defeat cost General Galtieri his, and may yet hasten the end of military rule in Argentina. Today, Argentina still refuses to formally end hostilities. Britain's international support in the dispute has been eroded, and the financial reckoning promises to total at least two billion pounds. That's a million pounds for each Falkland Islander. We've come a long way from that first Saturday in April when the Prime Minister rose to address a crowded House of Commons. The House meets this Saturday to respond to a situation of great gravity. We are here because for the first time for many years, British sovereign territory has been invaded by a foreign power. 
after several days of rising tension in our relations with Argentina, that country's armed forces attacked the Falkland Islands yesterday and established military control of the islands. I must tell the House that the Falkland Islands and their dependencies remain British territory. No aggression and no invasion can alter that simple fact. It is a government's objective to see that the islands are freed from occupation and are returned to British administration at the earliest possible moment. the surge of national pride at the gathering of the task force was tinged with a sense of incredulity that it was happening at all. But as the routine exercises and the fun of the equator faded, as the Falklands drew nearer and the red alerts more frequent, the early hope that all this military muscle was here just to hasten a diplomatic settlement faded too. For the politicians and diplomats sprang to their action stations too late. The then American Secretary of State, Al Haig, shuttled frantically between Buenos Aires and 10 Downing Street in search of a peaceful settlement. His efforts, like those of the Peruvian government and the United Nations Secretary General, were doomed to failure. In Buenos Aires, General Galtieri and his junta were, as they had hoped, being swept along by what was for them an unfamiliar wave of popular support. But behind the confident smiles when the general flew in to visit his invading troops on the islands they called the Malvinas, lay considerable apprehension about the way ahead. For, as we now know, Galtieri had never dreamt that Britain would meet force with force. It was the well-publicized decision to withdraw the ice patrol ship HMS Endurance, the only British naval presence in these waters, that encouraged the Argentines to believe Britain was losing interest in the Falklands and South Georgia. Endurance was on what was to have been her last voyage in the area. In the view of her captain, Nick Barker, speaking shortly after the invasion of South Georgia, clues to Argentine intentions had been building up for some time. We all know by the cold shoulder we got in Ushuaia, by the notices in various newspapers, by the dab it off front, by the overflying of the C-130s over South Georgia, all the signs were there. And then the build-up of the fleet over the two weeks before it actually happened, all that was reported. Now, we could see it was going to happen. Why couldn't anybody else? Whitehall had been told not only that Argentine scrap metal merchants led by one Constantine Davidoff had landed on South Georgia, but that they brought with them soldiers who'd brazenly raised their national flag. But Argentina had indulged in actions and noises like this before. British decision-makers thought this was no different. But if they failed to read the signs that lost Britain the islands, there was no shortage of firm action to get them back. The frigate Plymouth, backed by the destroyer Antrim and the Endurance, began bombarding the South Georgia shoreline to demoralize the Argentines. The SAS and SBS had gone ashore to recce the enemy positions. A helicopter called in to rescue one group stranded by the appalling weather crashed on takeoff. So did a second. A third, brilliantly piloted through a snowstorm, lifted them out. The main attack met with no resistance. Rockets from the Endurance's Wasp helicopter knocking out an Argentine submarine, the Santa Fe, as she brought in reinforcements. The victory signal to London was in old-fashioned naval style. Be pleased to inform Her Majesty that the White Ensign flies alongside the Union flag on South Georgia. God save the Queen. As the Marines of M Company settled in, back in London, the Prime Minister and the Defence Secretary came out into Downing Street to break the news of the first victory to the nation. What's Just your reaction, rejoice Prime? at that news and congratulate our forces and the Marines. Are we going Good to night, declare war on Argentina, Mr Thatcher? Rejoice. 
Out on Hermes, the Harriers were lifting off for their first strike on the Falklands. In the quiet of a Port Stanley dawn, the defenders waited for the attack they knew must come. In the bid to knock out the runway, the Harriers had been backed up by Vulcan bombers flown from Ascension Island. The chaos was considerable, but how successful had they really been? High-level reconnaissance photographs, of which this was the first, showed apparent success. Only much later was it learnt that the Argentines had been dumping huge mounds of earth on the runway, shaping them to look like craters, and always leaving one side of the runway free for their aircraft to land or take off. Of 63 bombs dropped here, only one hit the runway. Out on Hermes, there were cheers as the Harriers returned. For this generation of British pilots, it was the first taste of real war. They would fly a thousand missions in this conflict, would lose 34 planes and helicopters. But now relief lay beneath the elation, especially for Flight Lieutenant David Morgan when he saw the bullet hole in his tail. Beneath the sea, British submarines were patrolling the 200-mile total exclusion zone Britain had declared around the islands. One of them controversially torpedoed Argentina's second biggest warship, the General Belgrano, outside the zone because it was still thought to be a threat to the task force. 360 men, one-third of her crew, died, mainly because her two escorting frigates ran away. British officers, too far away to be helped by Britain's early warning aircraft, knew they too were vulnerable to surprise attack. But in public, they played down their fears. Uh, I would put our chances as being considerably better than the opposition's. Um, and I would be prepared to put a bet on it 20 to 1 and be sure of doing well out of it. But on Tuesday, May the 4th, burning on the horizon, Argentina's revenge. The Sheffield had been hit. A Super 8 Andar fighter bomber had emerged briefly above the horizon to fire two deadly Exocet missiles. 20 men died, 261 were rescued by HMS Arrow. The Sea Kings took the 24 injured back to Hermes. Some survivors found their acrylic Navy issue trousers had melted onto their skins. They'd had only six seconds warning. Captain Sam Salt praised the courage of his crew. The men were quite incredible and I have no doubt that the ship's company really saved themselves largely by their own sensible efforts. They were quite remarkable. It's a very good ship. I'm sure every captain would say that their ship's company is the best afloat. But I certainly believe that Cap I knew. Captain, the... I'd just like to finish, if I could, and say that the other part of the decision to abandon was the fact that we were taking part or taking the attention of other ships and units in the area at a time when we were subject to attack. We had no hope of retrieving the fighting capability of that ship. We were not winning that fire, beating it. We were losing it. The decision to abandon ship had been taken after five hours and after a torpedo fired by an Argentine submarine had narrowly missed the burning vessel. Six days later, she sank. With the help of some remarkable mid-air refueling, fighter reinforcements were flown out from Britain. That made a total of 40 Harriers to face at least 100 operational Argentine warplanes. In London, a protest rally for peace was backed by 30 church and peace groups and 17 Labour MPs led by Tony Benn. We are here for peace. We're here to save further lives being lost. And uh, there are millions of people in Britain who agree with what we're saying. But only hours earlier, that very same day, landing craft had surged away from the assault ships towards the bleak coastline of San Carlos water. The main attempt to recapture the islands had begun. The first wave had gone ashore at night, 
With initial opposition light and easily dealt with, more troops were moving in to consolidate the bridgehead. After seven weeks, the British were back on the Falklands again. By hand and by helicopter, the troops busied themselves setting up some protection against the cold and the enemy. The islanders helped as best they could. There was time for a meal and time to contemplate the sheer scale of the amphibious force that had dared to sail into the narrow waters of San Carlos. Canberra, nicknamed the Great White Whale, would be the most tempting target of all. The Argentine jets lifted off in waves from mainland bases to challenge the Harriers and the Rapier missile defences. Then suddenly they were there. The British were to call this Bomb Alley. The Argentine pilots dubbed it Death Valley. A missile heading directly for Canberra was intercepted just in time. Two ships were slightly damaged. Several had narrow escapes. Two 500-pound bombs that hit HMS Antelope didn't go off. One later started a fire. The other exploded, killing the bomb disposal expert trying to defuse it. By the end of the conflict, Argentine pilots had knocked out seven ships. But it's sobering to reflect that about half of all Britain's warships were hit by bombs or missiles, many of which failed to explode. HMS Argonaut caught fire while being repaired after an earlier attack and 21 sailors were killed, 23 injured, when HMS Coventry was sunk. Nine men died on the container ship Atlantic Conveyor, hit by an Exocet missile intended for HMS Hermes. And several hours after this, a bomb hit a British ammunition dump, explosions dominating the sky over San Carlos. Defence chiefs had bargained on losing up to 15% of their men, 25% of their equipment, but now they needed a victory and needed it fast. May the 29th and the welcome wreckage of surrender littered the hamlet of Goose Green. Out of the smoke of a fierce battle across open ground came no fewer than 1,400 dejected Argentine prisoners, defeated by a mere 600 men of two para. And so they flew the flag again here too and were offered refreshments and asked for autographs by the 114 inhabitants of Goose Green who'd been imprisoned in their community hall for a whole month. Then two para buried 13 comrades who'd fallen in the battle. Captain James, Lieutenant Barry, Corporal Hardman, Corporal Sullivan, Corporal Fryer, Lance Corporal Corp, among them, their commanding officer, Colonel H. Jones. His country gave him the Victoria Cross, his staff sergeant this tribute. He was the best, the very best. The 34 wounded paras were taken to the field hospital at Ajax, where surgeons boasted that everyone who made it there alive made it out alive. That was soon to be put to the test by the biggest single British tragedy of the war, the bombing of Bluff Cove. 63 men were to die, 41 of them Welsh Guardsmen on the landing ship Sir Galahad, after much confusion over where and how they should disembark. This is the story of that day, as seen by some who survived. There was one appalling noise down below of very frightened men, screaming and yelling and not knowing where to go, calling for their friends. Of course, I didn't feel that the hands were getting burned. You just felt this heat linger there and then pass off. I thought about my wife and my, my little son at home. There's a lot of guys very, very badly burnt. People you recognize straight away, but you really didn't know what to do to them. 
everybody's trying to be helpful. Some cases being too helpful, you know, and trying to um, pick somebody up and hurting them in the process. The hair began to crackle, and you think you're going to suffocate, so you put up your hands to put the hair out. They were on fire, and they melted. Beyond me, a few figures moving on fire, arms out. I felt myself that I was dead. I was somewhere else. Helicopters seemed to have appeared from nowhere. The pilots were absolutely extraordinary. I mean, nothing seemed to daunt them. There were some instances in the thick black smoke where I suppose the rules say a pilot should never ever take his aircraft, but it didn't seem to worry the pilots on that day. I remember the helicopter pilot coming right down low and using his rotor blades and blow the life raft away from the rear end of the ship, keeping an eye like a shepherd with a sheep. Above all sense of we're not going into the smoke, we're not going to die, um, was the intense relief of the breeze. The first helicopter I saw was picking up this man in the fluorescent suit and he had been one of the people who couldn't get through because the bombs had destroyed the ways through. You haven't got time to think of, you know, the great tragedy of it all as people talk about later on. I didn't feel like that. I mean, you know you're alive. I suppose because your soul is grief and, and, and tragedy doesn't actually grip you straight away. You don't start seizing it. Terrible waste and a long way to go to get sunk. I have vivid memories of coming ashore and being met by smiling, helpful, extremely polite members of the 2nd Battalion Parachute Regiment. And they were jumping into the water to pull the boats ashore. And I have vivid memories of a bottle of whiskey appearing from somewhere. Now, God knows, two para had been through quite enough. But on that particular afternoon, they had nothing better to do than to look after the Welsh Guards. You can't blame one specific person. I just put it down to an act of war. You paid your money and you take your chances. Of all the possible ways of approaching Port Stanley, the Argentines never dreamt that the British would simply walk. Yomping, the Royal Marines called it, a 70-mile trek that will go down as one of the greatest feats of arms in British military history. Helicopters were only freed for troop carrying after they'd lifted forward the artillery for softening up the enemy. While the big guns pounded the Argentines around Port Stanley, British soldiers carried out daring nighttime attacks to capture seemingly impregnable mountain positions. And then, suddenly, no more open fire. No more open fire. the mountains came alive with Argentine soldiers who'd had enough. The total surrender was as sudden as it was unexpected. There is a white flag flying over Stanley. <laughs> Very marvellous. <laughs> and the British marched in to claim their prize. The honour of raising the Union Jack over Port Stanley again fell to the same Royal Marines who'd surrendered here 73 days before. No, I never had any doubt before. Back in Downing Street, crowds gathered to congratulate the Prime Minister as the extent of the victory became known. In Port Stanley, eight and a half thousand well-equipped Argentine defenders, including four crack battalions never even called into action, were surrendering to a British land force two-thirds the size. If only they'd known then what was later revealed by General Moore. As the Duke of Wellington said after Waterloo, uh, it was a damn close-run thing. Batteries of guns which started that final night with 400 rounds a gun, were down to as few as six. If anybody has a go uh, back home about the quality of the youth uh, in our country, they ought to have seen these guys. Uh, they were absolutely tremendous. There remained much for the British troops to do, try and repair the homes and lives of the 2,000 islanders. Bury the often nameless Argentine soldiers where they fell. Clear more than 25,000 mines left behind to claim yet more British casualties. And above all, to remember the places, mountains and ships where 255 of Britain's soldiers, sailors and airmen died.
the men of two para were summoned to church by their chaplain to remember something else as well what i would ask you to remember is what you felt when you thought you were going to die and what was important to you then the answer to that lay 8,000 miles away when the men who had fought so hard finally came home. Later, after the euphoria, the formal recognition by a grateful country, the parades, the ceremony on the lawn of Buckingham Palace, with a quiet, sobering reminder for the nation of the human cost. Remembrance Sunday, and Prince Andrew, a helicopter pilot with the task force, lays a wreath in memory of those who gave their lives. A destroyer in Portsmouth Harbour, and a baby girl born after her father sailed to war is christened on board the ship where he died. The wife of Sergeant Mackay, killed as he stormed an enemy machine gun post, collects his Victoria Cross. It's hard, she said, when one has to die to gain something. A lone piper played through the wind and the rain when the bodies of Sergeant Mackay and 63 others who died in the conflict were brought home to be reburied closer to the people and places they had loved. Back on the other side of the world, they too vowed never to forget. The armed conflict on the islands was over. The argument about the islands remains. Reach for Rennie. Now in handy strips for on the spot relief. Rennie. Get the pampers, darling. Why do we use pampers all the time? Susan's mummy uses proper nappies. <laughs> and so did I. But cherry nappies are cloth. And when cloth gets wet, it stays wet. <laughs> pampers are different. How? They have a special liner that lets the wetness soak into the padding, but hates letting it back to wet a baby's skin. And here's the proof. A terry and a pampers are made equally wet. The blotter shows how much less of that wetness soaks back on pampers. And there's elastic in the legs to help with the leaks. <laughs> so why didn't I have pampers when I was a baby? <laughs> you would have done if they'd been around them. New elasticated pampers protect a baby from wetness like terries never could. Because there will always be suit, three shirts, ties, the style of shopping you prefer, and a sweater, the inevitable extra, early morning tea, 15 calls to Aberdeen, Scotland, the change in direction, I wonder if you can help me, I've got to get back to Bahrain tonight, there will always be the American Express card, welcome around the world, 
And just around the corner. American Express? Oh, could you send them round? To apply, take a form. Or ring 01200 0200. Welcome back. It's been said that while Britain was fighting yesterday's war in the Falklands, the Israelis were fighting tomorrow's war in the Lebanon. They virtually annihilated the aircraft and missile systems the Russians had supplied to the Syrians. And they succeeded in getting the Palestine Liberation Organization out of Beirut. But the cost was increased world understanding of the Palestinian cause and a massacre which still threatens the future of Israel's leaders. It was not the first issue to divide the Israeli people this year. In a corner of the Sinai Desert, a bizarre drama was enacted in the cause of peace. 2,000 militant Jewish settlers were evicted from the town of Yamit by Israeli troops. The protesters were trying to prevent the place being given back to Egypt under the terms of the Camp David peace agreement. When the diehards had been cleared out, the Israelis bulldozed or blew up the town. Ironically, some members of the Israeli government saw one reward of the peace with Egypt as freedom to wage war. The defense minister, Ariel Sharon, believed security on the Egyptian border in the south would let Israel concentrate on the threat from the north. The prime minister, Mr. Begin, did not disagree. An event in London triggered the war the attempted assassination of the Israeli ambassador. It was not proved the Palestine Liberation Organization did it, but the Israelis said it was the 290th violation by the PLO of the year-old truce. So 48 hours later, Israeli tanks rolled north into Lebanon. The Israelis called it Operation Peace for Galilee. Its declared aim was to push the PLO back 25 miles from Israel so the Galilee area would be beyond the range of PLO rockets and artillery. The Israelis said the PLO had used the previous ceasefire to reinforce and re-equip. The Israelis surrounded and bombarded PLO strongholds like Tyre and Sidon. Civilians had been warned to get out first. There was no accurate count of the number made homeless, but it was at least tens of thousands. The declared aim of the invasion was achieved in five days, but the Israelis fought on. They took on the Syrians to the east. Israeli tanks, it's claimed, knocked out nine of the Syrian Soviet-built T-72s. And Israeli fighter bombers were unleashed. Their targets, the Bekaa Valley, and 19 batteries of Syrian surface-to-air missiles, all of which were damaged or destroyed. At least 80 Syrian warplanes were shot down. The Israelis lost just one. Within a week, the Syrians were shut out of this war. But the conflict was entering its bloodiest stage. The Israelis struck the PLO at their heart, Beirut. The Israelis claimed they were aiming only at PLO fire positions. The siege of West Beirut was to last 10 weeks. Eight thousand PLO fighters were trapped inside. Half a million civilians were trapped too, the ones who could not or would not escape. The Red Cross were to put the number killed in this war at 17,000, injured 30,000. 
and at this time in Beirut many were short of food. Bit by bit, the Israelis tightened their stranglehold, battling back the PLO in the suburbs. Then one day in mid-August, Israeli rockets and bombs and shells fell on West Beirut for 11 hours without respite. President Reagan, furious, protested. The American negotiator, Philip Habib, had shuttled between Lebanon, Israel and Syria. Finally, this was the deal he did. 800 US Marines went into Beirut with French and Italian troops as a peacekeeping force, while the PLO pulled out of the city to a reckless farewell salute. The PLO fighters were scattered around nine Arab nations and Ariel Sharon seemed to have got near his goal of crushing the PLO as a military force. Still, the PLO leader, Yasser Arafat, gained something of a diplomatic victory and was hailed a hero by an Arab world which had deserted him in battle. But with the PLO gone from Beirut, their chief Lebanese enemy saw his fortunes rise. Bashir Jamal, a ruthless young Christian warlord, now president-elect. He'd led the country's biggest private army, the right-wing phalangists, who'd cooperated with the Israeli invaders. The Americans backed Jamal. Though they'd opposed the war, they applauded its result, the prospect of a strong pro-Western government in Lebanon. But in one explosive instant, that hope was shattered. Jamal was killed by an assassin's bomb. By the time he was buried, the Israelis had taken the law into their own hands. They'd advanced into West Beirut. So the Israelis had captured an Arab capital city. Their justification to preserve order, a claim that was to backfire when the world saw these horrific scenes. Hundreds of Palestinian civilians massacred in an area the Israelis claimed to control. The Israelis had sent their allies, the Christians, into Sabra and Shatila camps to root out pro-PLO gunmen. Instead, the Christians reaped a revenge that shocked the world. In Israel, the protests which had been growing against this long war now erupted in angry shame. The biggest demonstration ever seen in Israel made its special targets Defence Minister Sharon and Prime Minister Begin. Amid furor in the Israeli parliament, General Sharon's defense was that no one in the cabinet had dreamt what the Christians let loose would do. Mr. Begin resisted demands for a judicial inquiry, but threatened defections from his government forced him to give in. The inquiry's findings, when published, may break his ruling coalition. In Lebanon itself, Bashir Jamal was replaced as president by his brother Amin. He's trying to balance his diplomacy abroad. At home, he's having trouble asserting himself against Lebanon's constantly warring factions. To help him, the American-led peacekeeping force is back in Beirut. But the obstacles ahead are immense. Three foreign armies occupy Lebanon. The Israelis, the Syrians, and 7,000 PLO still in the countryside talks to get them out won't be easy. And hundreds of thousands of victims of this war, despite the efforts of relief organizations, face winter with little comfort. Right up to the last minute, there was doubt and argument over whether the Pope should visit a Britain at war. In the end, he came, and the prayers and pageantry of his historic procession through the country reached out to touch the four million who follow his faith here and many who do not. By year's end, the more earthly prayers that the church might somehow find the six million pounds needed to pay for it all were well on the way to being answered. We now tell the story of the visit in the words of a pope whose warmth rivaled the long sunny days that followed him wherever he went. Today, for 
for the first time in history, a bishop of Rome sets foot on English soil. As we proceed to celebrate the great mystery of our faith, we cannot forget that an armed conflict is taking place. In our prayers, let us remember the victims of both sides. We pray for the dead, that they may rest in Christ. I express once more my good wishes to all the people of Britain, and in particular to Her Majesty the Queen, especially on this, the anniversary of her coronation. deep desire, my ardent hope and prayer is that my visit may serve the cause of Christian unity. It's a memorable service, I don't know. Yes, yes, yes. Marvelous. Very moving. I believe in you. I believe in all mankind. I believe in the unique dignity of every human being. Today, the scale and the horror of modern warfare whether nuclear or not, makes it totally unacceptable as a means of settling differences between nations. As I travel through Liverpool, our motorcade will be passing along Hope Street. This name struck me immediately as an expression of the aspirations of the people who live here. Dear young people of Scotland, those who do not enjoy the fullness of what is called a normal way of life are often compensated in part by such things as a radiant love and selfless care. 
There had also been a second little-known appearance by the Pope at Westminster Cathedral when things didn't, well, quite go according to plan. The problem was someone had turned off the sound system. A new line in papal gestures, but the crowd loved it just the same. And just to be sure everyone's got the message. Microphone is <laughs> the Cardinal was then tempted into a passing reference to the church's finances. And so are we. The crowd loved it. I love you, said the Pope. And the Pope's love for his fellow countrymen takes him next year back to his long-suffering Poland. At year's end, martial law was over, but many shackles remained. It was a year in which the army and the police held a tight grip on Poland. They systematically neutralized anyone and anything connected with Eastern Europe's first independent trade union, Solidarity. Along with union leader Lech Wałęsa, more than 10,000 people were interned. 3,600 people were tried for violating martial law, and at least 15 people are officially said to have been killed, although unofficially it's believed the figure is higher. When martial law began, the government spokesman talked of what he called the Great Union Solidarity, which would return. Ten months later in the Polish Parliament in October, with a quick show of hands, MPs, almost all of them from the Communist Party, killed the union which represented the hopes of 10 million workers. Solidarity ceased to exist. Poland's military council had removed the legal basis for what they called an out-of-control opposition party. But they did not end the emotional commitment of Polish workers and intellectuals to solidarity and its goals of better living and working conditions. Martial law ended the decline in many parts of the economy, but like in the mines, the price was high. A return to conditions solidarity fought to improve like the six-day working week. Through clandestine bulletins, Solidarity's underground leaders, many of whom were eventually arrested, kept up the idea that street protests and strikes would force the government to realize their mistake in crushing Solidarity. They hoped protests would force the government to talk. They didn't. On May Day, this spontaneous mass demonstration against military rule produced tears of delight. It was a rare success. 
Most underground calls, though, were only partially heeded. There were also thousands of stunts, like this self-propelled banner across a Warsaw street, all risky expressions of defiance. On different anniversaries, more daring solidarity sympathizers took to the streets or tried to organize strikes. But as the months passed, the government realized no solidarity leader would open dialogue on the government's terms. Protests seemed to strengthen the government's hand, a hand backed by the Soviet bloc. It brought activists into the open and enabled the authorities to neutralize many by beating them up, by jailing or internment, or by sackings. Even passive defiance, like this cross of flowers in Warsaw, was finally broken up by the authorities. On many occasions, protesters gave secret policemen the treatment they claim the authorities gave them. The release of Lech Wałęsa in November was a government masterstroke. It undermined the underground and confused those contemplating more protests. His release followed a church-state agreement aimed at ensuring the Pope comes next June. So now Prime Minister General Jaruzelski has suspended martial law, but many restrictions remain, leaving the future of the Polish crisis acutely uncertain. For plain citizen Wawensa, it means a long wait. But soon he believes the government will need him and solidarity. But the authorities clearly have other ideas to ensure there is no future threat to communism in Poland. Poland and how to ram home Western disapproval of what was happening there to its Soviet masters was to affect the whole question of East-West relations and open up embarrassing cracks in the Atlantic Alliance. Most would be cemented over, but not without months of argument. President Reagan began the year by taking a very tough line over Poland. He wanted the Russians punished because in his eyes they were responsible for martial law being imposed in Poland. We're not going to wait forever for improvement in the situation there. We have other steps that we can take. And what better way to punish the Russians than by making life difficult over the new gas pipeline being built to provide Europe with gas from the Soviet Union. The pipeline, Mr. Reagan said, will make Western Europe dependent on suspect communist energy. It's also going to protect the Soviet Union's Achilles heel, its dangerously weak economy. But by the summer, a lot of the bite seemed to have gone out of Mr. Reagan's pipeline bark. Plainly, Windsor Castle wasn't exactly the place to shout the odds about it. But even at the Versailles Economic Summit, the American president seemed to be more worried about his jelly beans than about the pipeline. Versailles ended with a vaguely worded declaration on trade with the Soviet Union, which made what happened next all the more startling. As European firms, including John Brown Engineering in this country, began shipping equipment to the Soviet Union for the pipeline, President Reagan began slapping sanctions on them. Mrs. Thatcher, who'd frequently presented herself as Mr. Reagan's best friend in Europe, was outraged. I do not believe in retrospective breaking of contracts. This is what is happening here, and I've spoken very firmly about it to the president because I think it is wrong. Had he said right at the beginning of that pipeline or his predecessor, look, we're against this, the license will not run for this, will not export any part of this. We would not have gone and made that contract, but we've made it. Now that's the point of principle. Mrs. Thatcher was even more upset by the Americans later in the year when they voted against Britain in the United Nations debate on the Falklands. The Prime Minister called Mr. Reagan's decision on that incomprehensible and disappointing. A row during most of the year over steel between the United States and Britain and other European countries didn't help matters either. Though that dispute was eventually settled, largely because of the change of government in West Germany. Chancellor Helmut Schmidt was replaced, not through an election, but by a parliamentary vote. With the German Liberals switching their support to the new man, Helmut Kohl. <laughs> Chancellor Kohl promptly promised better relations with the Americans and kept his promise by ensuring the end of the steel row. But an even more momentous change of leadership followed in the Soviet Union with the death of President Brezhnev. Under the last years of Mr. Brezhnev's rule, there seemed to be little hope of any major change in East-West relations. But now with his speedy replacement by Mr. Andropov, there seemed to be a chance to get things moving again though Mr. Andropov himself announced no immediate changes of policy. 
Oh. President Reagan insisted that he wanted deeds from Moscow, not just words. So he celebrates this Christmas here with Polish Americans, knowing that tough negotiations lie ahead with the Russians over nuclear arms, and if those negotiations fail, hostile demonstrations in Europe over American crews and Pershing missiles. Apart from the Soviet Union and West Germany, there were other changes at the top, but these by elections. In the Irish Republic, Dr. Garrett Fitzgerald was voted back into power with a new coalition government, having been voted out of office earlier in the year. In Spain, there were celebrations as the first socialist government for almost 50 years swept to victory. Their leader, Senor Felipe Gonzalez, called on Spaniards to get their country moving forward. Voters in their thousands turned out in El Salvador for what it had been hoped would be their first free elections in 50 years. No party won overall victory, and throughout polling day, shooting continued between leftist guerrillas who had boycotted the elections and government forces. The elections did not appear to have brought the peace which had been hoped for, and the Americans remained undecided over whether there had been enough progress in human rights to continue supplying military aid. Welcome back. For yet another year, the government, with Mrs. Thatcher's tight grip on the tiller, stuck firmly to its chosen economic course through the uncertainties of the continuing world recession. Inflation fell from 12 to near 6%. Another quarter of a million joined the dole queue. The day of the zero pay rise arrived for some. And the unions faced one of their toughest and most frustrating years yet. The Falklands distracted the Prime Minister from the economy but she found a message in it all. The spirit of the South Atlantic was the spirit of Britain at her best. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It has been said that we surprised the world. The British patriotism was rediscovered in those spring days. Mr. President, it was never rarely lost. For many of the lower paid health workers, there was a longer, much less successful campaign. They'd begun with high hopes. Uh, the odds are in fact stacked the other way against this government. This is a dispute that is not going to go away. There was no meeting of minds, and most nurses stayed at work, though hospital waiting lists lengthened and lengthened. Other unions' days of action to back them began strongly, but got nowhere. The train drivers felt themselves threatened by productivity and struck work twice. But the other railwomen didn't back them and they settled glumly. Three million unemployed, three million and rising, seemed to have divided the TUC and muffled its militants. The young unemployed brought to Westminster to demonstrate were resigned to getting nowhere. Hopeless. Only hopeless. Korea sent me for a job. The place they sent me to, they were pulling it down. That's how behind they are. <laughs> Outside of this hall, there is the stark reality. It's there that we've seen in all its nastiness. We have influenced nothing. We've seen the destruction of the National Health Service taking place before our very eyes. Have we been able to influence that? Surely the answer to that must be no. Just how long are we going to go along with this government? before this movement states quite clearly that enough is enough. The employment secretary blamed managers and unions in the past, especially unions. Of course there are moderates, good men and women amongst them, but all too often they're sickened, they're bullied, they're victimized and they're insulted by those who Sid Wheel so aptly described as squawking left-wing rabble, a selfish inconsiderate mob. They're closed by order of Mr. Ian McGregor and the World Slump, steel jobs by tens of thousands. They're closed the bankrupt DeLorean car plant in Belfast. Mr. DeLorean, arrested on a drugs charge, had many preoccupations. 
and their closed Laker Airways, the pioneer of the Skytrain, now undercut by the other airlines and deeply in the red. But Sir Freddie himself soon bobbed up again in the travel business, though he found most of the other agents wanted nothing to do with him. Just because I've had a fate, I've got to be dead. And I refuse to be dead. The Chancellor had an up and down year. Inflation came down, so did the pound. The Conservatives won a by-election seat at Mitcham in South London. The other party said it was just the Falklands factor. The movement that seemed to be growing most rapidly was nuclear disarmament. 20,000 women ringed the Greenham Common base. The Prime Minister had a victory parade. If she was distracted now, it was never from thinking and planning for the general election. The prospect of an approaching general election concentrated Labour Party minds on trying to put their house in order and end the internal feuding that has marked their recent years in opposition. As a result, they found a slight improvement in the opinion polls, but not as much as they'd hoped. 1982 saw the Labour Party moving decisively away from control by the Benites. The leader, Michael Foote, had the chance to reassert his personal authority as a result. Now, we've got to prepare for that day the day when we set about rescuing our country, the day when we set about changing the whole climate of international affairs, it's going to be a great day when we start on that task. Mr. Foote could afford to relax at Blackpool in a way that he'd not been able to do before as leader. In front of the Welsh at Welsh night, he even burst into song. I'm going to bring a watermelon to my golden eye. <laughs> the executive elections marked further defeats for the left. When the head stopped rolling, the right could outvote Mr. Foote as well as the Benites. In October, Labour made their first by-election gain for 11 years. John Speller's victory at Northfield was very narrow. He could have done a great deal better. But Mr. Foote could detect the beginnings of a Labour recovery. The party did still have its problems. There was Bob Mellish's resignation, for one. You can't, you can't be in the subject for 50 odd years. Walk away. In the Bermondsey by-election next year, Labour seemed set to have Peter Tatchell as their standard bearer. The man Mr. Foote had gone to great lengths to keep out. And the campaign against Militant ran into trouble. The editorial board wrong-footed the executive with their threats of legal action. And if expulsions are confirmed in the end, the executive is set for a whole series of rows, not just with Militant, but with the left-wing constituency parties as well. Mr. Foote has looked the part more this year, but with new challenges to his authority from the executive, the shadow cabinet and Ken Livingstone, the questions about his qualifications for number 10 remain. For the alliance, Hillhead in March was the only real triumph of the year. The comfortable victory won by the SDP's future leader, Roy Jenkins, hadn't looked at all certain during the campaign. But the Falklands War was bad news for Mr Jenkins. The SDP's fortunes declined and David Owen's fortunes improved. I must tell you quite bluntly, you're going to lose this war. We're going to force you off the Falklands. Nosotros creemos que van a perder. Dr. Owen looked well-placed in the leadership election in July, though Roy Jenkins did manage to beat off his challenge in the end. It was an uneasy year for the Alliance, with much bickering over the carve-up of seats. By the conference season, the deal was finally settled, with the Liberals looking decidedly better placed than their SDP partners. David Steele went to the Social Democrats' conference to conclude the peace. Now, this has been a difficult year for both our parties in the putting together of our alliance. But I believe that the mood of this conference, like my own at Bournemouth, is overwhelmingly to tell all our local parties to settle down and accept whatever disappointments there are inevitably on both sides in the final allocation of seats, and now to turn outwards onto the attack. The two leaders have a close relationship, too close for some of their supporters. But with no further by-election triumphs, only respectable seconds, the Alliance has a lot of ground to make up. One problem which continued to dog politicians of all parties was Northern Ireland. 
and the bombings continued in Ulster and mainland Britain. In July, four soldiers from the Blues and Royals and seven horses were killed in London. The IRA had planted a remote control bomb in a car on the route to Horse Guards Parade. Two hours later, seven men of the Royal Green Jackets were killed as they played in the bandstand in Regent's Park. The new Ulster Assembly opened amid more violence on the streets of Ulster. The Unionists won most seats. The SDLP and Provisional Sinn Féin didn't take theirs. The drop in Well Inn at Ballykelly, County Londonderry, was the scene of one of the worst incidents in Northern Ireland. Eleven soldiers and five civilians were killed, 66 others injured. He died trying to save their lives. He died for nothing. Catholic and Protestant families joined together in mourning the deaths of their relatives and friends. In recent months, it seemed as though 1982 was also the year of the spies. It all started in November, when Geoffrey Prime, a former employee of the government communications headquarters at Cheltenham, pleaded guilty to spying for the Russians for 14 years. His sentence, 35 years in prison, one of the longest for espionage since the war. A month later, Rona Ritchie, a British diplomat, was accused of having told her lover, an Egyptian diplomat, the contents of official telegrams while stationed in Tel Aviv. Her sentence, nine months suspended. The Attorney General said she had been more foolish than wicked. Then, Hugh Hamilton, a Canadian professor, was prosecuted for providing the Russians with NATO secrets. He'd even claimed he'd dined with the former head of the KGB and new Soviet leader, Yuri Andropov. His sentence, 10 years in prison. And finally, Captain Anatoly Zotov, a naval attaché at the Soviet Embassy in London, was accused of having tried to set up a spy network in this country. His sentence, back to Moscow. So, worries about the country's security, worries on a different plane about the security of its head of state. There was an unexpected guest at the palace, and a more controversial guest on a Caribbean island. But a happy new arrival hogged much of the limelight. Three minutes past nine on a June evening, the crowd spread the word rapidly and loudly. Two hours later, an archetypal proud father emerged, eager to share his happiness. I'm obviously relieved and delighted. It's marvelous. It's rather a grown-up thing, I found. <laughs> rather a shock to my sister. So. He's, he's, he's in marvelous form. Does the baby have any yeah, he looks marvelous. More prosaically, they put up the traditional notice on the railings of Buckingham Palace. And 24 hours later, very quickly, in line with current medical thinking, the mother was allowed home. Prince William weighed seven pounds, one and a half ounces, and seemed eager to display the marvellous form described by his father. And the second, in line to the throne, revealed even more character at his christening, making it very clear that ceremony was one thing, hunger was something much more important. But outsiders like Michael Fagan made an impact on the royals this year. He climbed into the Queen's bedroom and proved that palace security was non-existent. Immediately afterwards, the Queen's detective for 17 years, Commander Michael Trestrail, was forced to resign because of a homosexual relationship with a male prostitute. Trestrail was much liked at the palace and generally thought to be the best detective that had ever been in modern royal service, but his career ended there and then. Then there was Miss Coo Stark, who shared Prince Andrew's post Falklands rest and recuperation. No one in the royal family liked the ensuing publicity very much. But Prince William claimed the royal year for himself when, just before Christmas, his parents allowed his first photo call since his christening. The result provided, perhaps, the best family pictures of the year. Now the small William looks towards a couple of months in Australia and New Zealand next spring. He's destined to be a much-troubled little boy. One of the Prince of Wales' favourite projects 
finally came to fruition this year with the lifting of Henry VIII's warship, the Mary Rose, which sank off Portsmouth in 1545. The Prince is president of the Mary Rose Trust, which spent four million pounds and many anxious years to bring the wooden warship to the surface. And just when they were beginning to relax, a small hiccup, a lifting frame collapsed. No lasting damage though, and soon the Princess was able to see the ship back in its original dockyard in Portsmouth. Last week there was heroism as three Trinity House pilots rescued survivors from the ferry European Gateway near the entrance to Harwich Harbour. Back in January came the year's unlikeliest hero, the civil servant on his way home from the office. A Boeing 737 had crashed into the Potomac River in Washington. The wings hadn't been de-iced properly before takeoff. It scythed through traffic on a bridge, killing six people. The only member of the crew to survive, a stewardess, was rescued by helicopter. But a passenger with her, her husband and baby son already dead, was too weak and battling for her life. Enter Lenny Skutnik. Her eyes rolled back in her head and she started, I think she started to go under. I was behind her and kind of stroking, swimming and, uh -huh. and pushing her toward the shore. Uh -huh. And when she got close enough, the other people on the shore rescuers drug her out the rest of the way. I only did what any other human being would have done, said Lenny. I was just there at the right time. 1982 seemed to take a heavy toll of the rich and famous. Among those to die, the former conservative politician Rab Butler said to be the best prime minister we never had. And Arthur Rubenstein, a leading pianist for no fewer than 90 years. We lost a princess, a war hero, and some giants of the silver screen who we remember all too briefly tonight. You were Play them. Play as time goes just by. A a sigh, just a sigh. I don't think I uh, was accomplished enough as an actor to be remembered for that particularly. Uh, no, I'd like to be remembered as a, as a decent human being and a caring one. I've been trying all day to draw some profound conclusions about living four score years. I haven't thought of anything. Surprised you got here so fast. <laughs> Come on, everybody. I never heard one moan or resentment. He would say, where's my bloody legs? the honey to the dear old queen. Buzz, 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 honeybee, honeybee. Buzz if you like, but don't sing me. And I have no hesitation in saying to you, uh, uh, Mildred, <laughs> that he's the first man you should turn to if you're in any sort of trouble. Well, she's not in trouble, Captain. No, no, no. <laughs> As always, new stars, new heroes are in the making. Being in the public eye can be a source of inspiration when, like Daley Thompson, you're winning, but not so hot when, like England's cricketers, you're not. The world of sport thrives on its ups and downs, whether they're Erica Rose at Twickenham or Britain's footballers battling through the World Cup. This year, three of our teams made it to Spain for the competition. England started with the sort of flourish that we've been dreaming about. And Robson makes it 2-1 here. And Mariner! Scotland raised a few Scotland hopes against Neary Brazil. Getting into a good position. Oh, what a goal from David Neary. 
and Northern Ireland turned out to be the best of the bunch. But in the event, none of them got past round two and Brazil began to look more and more soccer's racing certainty. That's until Italy and Paolo Rossi decided it was time to crack that particular nut. Useful looking cross. It's 1-0. Italy. Rossi. Oh, it's been given away. Here's Rossi. Oh, it could be a calamitous mistake. And the shot from Tardelli. Rossi's got a hat-trick. So Italy met the defensive West Germans in the final. A goal. They've almost had too much time until it comes for Tardelli. There's still further ground to go. And the chance for Altabelli. Italian skill finally beat German cynicism 3-1, but for the game of football, it had been a bit too close for comfort. At home, Spurs needed a replay and a Glenn Hoddle penalty to stop Queen's Park Rangers picking up the cup. And so Spurs have done it again. And Villa's Peter With, aided and abetted by a friendly goalpost, made sure that England's habit of winning the European Cup continued. And soccer's most spectacular prize was back in the Midlands. At Epsom, it was favourites' time in the derby. A lot of upon the outside, going very well for Panamiri. The six derby victory in prospect here for Vincent O'Brien as they come inside the final third off. Golden Fleece touching... Golden board. Fleece followed in the footsteps of Shergar to make the bookies dig deep into their leather satchels and complete the perfect punter's day out. Without Borg or Lendl, a Connors McEnroe final seemed about right at Wimbledon. If it was McEnroe against Attila the Hun, he'd still get the bird, so Connors' win made the crowd's day. And Jimmy seemed pleasantly pleased as well. But if your taste is for superheroes, this year the only difference between Daley Thompson and Superman seemed to be that Thompson still needs a little help to get in the air. The two major titles and a world record made him the nation's sportsman of the year. Seb Coe doesn't get much practice recognising runners from the back, but he'll remember Ferner, who beat him in Athens. With Obet and Co injured, it could have been a lean year on the track, but Steve Cram strode into the record books with wins in the European and Commonwealth Games. Alan Wells and Mike McFarlane's Christmas stockings may well have contained thicker vests. The camera couldn't split them in Brisbane, the first major championship to end in a dead heat. Motor racing had more than its usual share of harrowing moments. Gilles Villeneuve died in a sickening shower of metal. And just when the championship seemed his for the taking, Pironi crashed too. The summer's test cricket became a simple battle of the two best all-rounders in the world. Pakistan's Imran Khan, a man with the style and sophistication of a film star, blasted England with the ball, then picked up the bat to steer Pakistan to their second ever win over England. But Ian Botham, more power than poise, wasn't about to be upstaged by anyone. England could do with some of that Botham sorcery in Australia. Down under, the man of the moment is Greg Chappell, taking his side two up in the ashes. Maybe Bob Willis should send for Daley Thompson. Coming next, in 1983 that is, could the Falklands conflict have been avoided? The Franks Committee reports. The Pope returns to Poland and visits El Salvador too. Will Mrs. Thatcher call a general election? Britain wakes up to breakfast television. A royal tour down under and baby goes too. Join us again as ITN brings you those stories and more throughout another year. We can't always promise that the news will be good news, but we can at least leave you tonight with one of the memories that meant most to Britain in the making of 82. Good night and a happy new year.